Good morning. We're going to go ahead and get started with our program this morning, but do feel free in the midst of our time together, if you need more coffee or things to drink, feel free to get up and, and go do that. But we are going to get started this morning. I'm so glad you're here. I'm Terry Bradford Rouse. I'm the Senior Director for Alumni and Parent Relations, and uh, I'm so thrilled we have such a beautiful morning to celebrate uh, so many things together. You may have noticed in our tagline for homecoming in our materials that went out, the phrase says, we can't wait for you to come home. And I think in so many ways that is so true. And I'm going to take a little liberty uh, with the word home, but I was thinking about that word and thinking about home is where you reside. It's where you feel welcome. It's where you work hard things out. You create memories. It's where you grow up and where you launch. Well, obviously, Westmont is not your home of origin, but I do hope that Westmont has a place in your heart and life that resembles home. We are here to celebrate our lives together, to share our stories, the ups and downs, and God's faithfulness through it all. So welcome home. We hope you have a wonderful time while you're here. And um, just enjoy reliving memories, but also making new memories. I am going to introduce now Denise Jackson to open us up in a word of prayer. Denise is our um, Alumni Council President, and she's also a member of the Board of Trustees. So Denise. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Terry. First, I'd like to shout out to the class of 1989, is that right? Who are, um, who are celebrating their 25th um, uh, reunion this year. I was an RD in, in Clark when many of them were freshmen, and it's great to see some of them among us today. As I told my friend Sharon Rose, I didn't know her back in those days because she wasn't a problem <laughs> child. So. <laughs> It's great to get to reunite as grown-ups. <laughs> Please join me in prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, as we gather underneath these magnificent magnolia trees, the symbol of dignity and ancient history, we are thankful for and cognizant of that like the evergreen, you are our ancient of days, consistent and unchanging. We pause from frenzied lives in these hours to thank and celebrate and acknowledge the obedience of Ruth Kerr, the sacrifice of those who came before us, and your preeminence. We thank you for Westmont, the rich and enduring relationships formed here, those who are unable to be here with us, and those who are seated with you this morning in a banquet. We thank you for the work of heart and hands of all the alums who are here this morning, but particularly for your servants, Daniel, Kristen, Byron, and Lisa, whom we honor today. Thank you for each class that has gathered this weekend to rekindle the memories of their youth and reflect upon their journeys. We remember in our prayers those who've served the, who serve the college today and have served in generations of the past. Great indeed is your faithfulness to us, and we are a thankful people. Bless our fellowship today, in Jesus' name, amen. One of the privileges that we have today is to honor three, four of our alumni, actually, and I know, and I said this to them, that while we're honoring them, in so many ways they represent so many of you out in this audience and the Westmont sort of audience in the world. I love how our graduates go on really to do amazing work, to live their life and their calling in a way that honors God and really changes the world. Those words perhaps are used in many arenas, but I believe it's true and I know it's true because I have the privilege of meeting with a lot of alumni across the country throughout you know, different events that we're involved in. And I just, I'm always so touched by the stories. And today we get to hear 
um, from three particular alumni who we are honoring today, but um, I hope you all feel honored in the process as well. Our first honoree is going to be introduced by Sergio Hernandez. Sergio is a graduate of the class of 2007. He is the coordinator of current student and young alumni programs, and the first award is going to go to the young alumni of the year. So Sergio. Good morning. I have the privilege to present the Young Alumni Award. The Young Alumni Award recognizes a graduate of the past 10 years with a distinguished professional career who shows promise for, for the future and models a life of Christian principles and values learned here at Westmont. It is an honor to present this year's award to Daniel Zia. Come up. <laughs> Daniel, a native of Brookings, Oregon, graduated in 2006 with a degree in Enterprise Development and Communication Studies. He was involved in various activities, and a few highlights include being the founder of the Westmont Business, Business and Investments Club. He wrote a daily devotional for students and also served as a resident assistant his junior year. But some would argue his most significant accomplishment here at Westmont was marrying up to a wonderful woman, Sarah Smith. Together they have two beautiful children and two beagles. <laughs> Daniel has excelled as one of the premier realtors in the nation. He's the owner and founder of the Zia Group and has helped his team become the number one real estate team in the greater Santa Barbara area, selling more homes than any other team. He has been voted the number one realtor multiple times by the Santa Barbara Independent and the Santa Barbara News Press. In addition, he was awarded Realtors Magazine's Under 30. He also received Keller Williams Platinum Level Award for being the, in the top 1% of Keller, Keller Williams agents worldwide. Daniel's commitment to Westmont is second to none. His humble and generous spirit is evident in his devotion of his time and resources to the college and his community. It is not uncommon for Daniel to be the first to volunteer his home for an alumni event or offered to sponsor uh, your alumni chapter and set aside time to take a student or two to coffee or lunch. He's often called me and let me know of internships and jobs for students and alumni as well. He has served on the Young Alumni Council since its inception in 2012 and has been instrumental in leading the Santa Barbara Young Alumni Committee, which has created multiple new events for young alumni here in Santa Barbara. Above all the accolades and the accomplishment, Daniel is a man of integrity and a lover of Christ. Long before I personally knew Daniel, I remember as a freshman receiving his daily email devotionals, the VODD. What stuck, stuck to me was how this college sophomore was willing to be so transparent about his life and his faith journey, and how his zeal was to honor Christ. As time passed, Daniel and I became great friends, and it was refreshing to see how evident how he truly lived that out and wrote, truly lived the words he wrote out. One story that I recall is um, walking to Emerson and Daniel uh, on the, uh, across campus was, uh, there was a line of dining commons workers and I saw Daniel pull out and I saw him go to the line of the, uh, the, the dining com commons workers were sitting on a bench and him driving over there and pulling up and saying, would any of you like a ride? And that's the heart that Daniel had, always willing to serve when no one was watching. And that is who Daniel is. He is a man who truly desires to know and love Jesus more and share Christ's love to his community through service. Mm -hmm. Daniel, thank you for your commitment and service to Westmont and the Santa Barbara community. Mm -hmm. And we're going to present Daniel with the award, the Young Alumni Award. Thank you. Do I open it? No, not right now. Okay. <laughs> Uh, well, thank you. Thank you, Sergio. I don't even remember uh, a lot of that, but um, I, am, I am so humbled and honored and uh, grateful to be with you here today. Um, West Juan has always been uh, near and dear to my heart. Um, like uh, Sergio mentioned, I did meet my lovely wife here. We actually met as, uh, as students previewing Westmont when we were in high school. 
And I was sharing the story um, earlier today, but, you know, as a 17-year-old boy, I was very spiritual at the time. And my decision to attend Westmont was, Lord, if this is the kind of hot Christian girl that's going here next year, <laughs> sign me up. So, <laughs> so great, great recruiting tool. But we... We had, we had such an impactful time at Westmont. We, uh, we met here, we fell in love here. Um, we were one of the crazy few who got married in college uh, while at Westmont. Um, I came in to college um, uh, running a business that I started in high school and at Westmont I transitioned to running my current business. Um, so some really big, uh, big events. And while Westmont, uh, my Westmont experience was good, it wasn't necessarily easy. Um, some of our uh, most difficult experiences in our life also occurred at Westmont. And it was uh, a time for my wife and I to really experience the, um, the intentional and authentic community of Westmont. And, um, you know, while, while Westmont sometimes is known as Camp Westmont, and on the surface everything seems good and rosy, the beauty about Westmont is when that's not the case and you get a chance to share authentically and, uh, and, and to be real and you're going through something tough, um, the Westmont community is there in an even more present way. Um, the faculty, the staff, the students, resident life, um, and we really experience that and we will be um, forever grateful for those transformational years. And uh, as I was prayerfully seeking the Lord the last few weeks about what to share here this morning, um, the Lord brought so many things to mind, it was actually, uh, it was difficult to choose what to share. And uh, interesting enough, uh, no, nothing that came to mind was about me or, or my story. But I would love just to really quickly share um, just two stories um, with you. Um, the first is uh, a man named Victor. He's a friend of mine, really incredible man of God, extremely humble. Uh, he, uh, if you can believe it, he's a writer. He's an exporter of dates and almonds and mangoes all over the world. And yet he's humble enough to be the parking attendant uh, at church. And I've always respected him. And he shared this story at a Bible study one day where um, he was sailing for the first time when he was young from Hawaii back to California. And he, he describes this most perfect day. The sun is shining. Uh, he is cruising at X number of knots, <clears throat> just, just absolutely cruising. The wind is in his face, this feeling of exhilaration, uh, this intense feeling of, of motion and momentum. And a few hours later, like any good sailor, he, uh, he checks his bearing to see where he has ended up. And he comes to the stark realization that he is nowhere, uh, nowhere near where he expected, <clears throat> excuse me, where he expected to end up. And he told me, he said, Daniel, I learned that day to never confuse motion with direction. And that was, that struck me so powerfully at the time and that, is, that has sat with me um, really every, every day since that. And now that my wife and I are coming up on 10 years being married in June, uh, which I'm so grateful for, my business is on its 10th year, um, we're soon to round 10 years after Westmont, um, you know, I think like a lot of us here, uh, my wife and I are asking the questions, you know, have we ended up where we thought we'd be? Uh, have we ended up where we want to be? And then most importantly, have we ended up where uh, God wants us to be? And I think those are um, poignant questions for us here today at this reunion and homecoming um, is for all of us to, as part of this Christian community and as part of this authentic Christian experience and joining together, my hope is that we would take some time to ask those questions the next couple of days and, um, and really just marinate on that and be open to any subtle shifts the Lord may want in our life. For me, that's I want to work fewer hours and I want to spend more time with my family. I want to say no more often that I've been saying yes and have more time and energy for those relationships that God is calling me to in the season. I want to be okay letting go of some past friendships that, uh, that, that aren't um, as relevant in this season and being okay with that and not trying to sustain every relationship in my life. Um, the other story that I want to share with you is, uh, comes from my dad. My dad is uh, an amazing man of God, someone who I've always loved and respected, but it really wasn't until a handful of years ago where he really, he became my hero. Um, he described himself as a, as a big fish in a small, a, a small pond in front of a, a small town up in Oregon of 10,000 people. 
And he was a, a man of influence. He ran a successful business for 25 years. He was the chairman of the board of a, um, of a local credit union. He was the port commissioner. He had all of these uh, roles of authority and influence. And when the econ economic downturn happened, um, I got to, I had the, the honor and privilege of, of watching each of these roles um, be stripped away from him. And uh, most of his assets kind of lost in that time as well. And I got to watch him in this process, and my respect and love for him just grew. And he shared one day something that will stick with me until the day I die. He said, God is not concerned about our success. He is concerned about our growth. And, and I'll say that one more time. God is not concerned with our success. He is concerned with our growth. And for someone that has always wanted to be successful, who is always um, doing, 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 um, who's been through some hard things, but um, who the Lord has always proved faithful. That just really impacted, uh, impacted me, uh, just that reframing of what success, success means. And, and it's kind of setting that in the context of today. We're going to be interacting with people that we haven't seen for years and years, and there's this natural comparison that may occur, this, this uh, fleshly envy that could come up, this, I wish I was, I had that beautiful spouse, or that wonderful family, or I started this business, or I wrote this great book, or I did this ministry. Now, my hope is that that wouldn't be a part of today, that we could prayerfully encourage one another to put a different lens on and change our definition of success, and that we would be brave enough to share truly and authentically where we're at in this moment and the seasons of growth that God has brought us through, that it would be less about what we are doing and what we have done and the people that we have interacted with and how we have changed and grown in our faith in the Lord. And, and I just want to just take a, just a special reminder, too, to recognize the people that are in those tough seasons right now, the, the people that um, are battling cancer, that are having marital difficulties, that may have hesitated to get in the car to come here this weekend because they just got divorced or they just lost their job. And, and my hope is that we would have um, eyes to see and ears to hear um, and to encourage them to also shift their focus and to celebrate that season of an intense growth that they're in and join with them in an authentic way. So um, that's what I really appreciate about uh, this Westmont community. And I hope that when, uh, as we're reliving it, that that would be the theme that permeates our time here today and tomorrow. So thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm so grateful. And uh, thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Daniel. Our next award is the Global Service Award. I will read what that is. The purpose of the Global Service Award is to honor alumni who have demonstrated faithful service in furthering God's kingdom in the international, missionary, or nonprofit world. This award recognizes alumni who are living out their faith in a diverse, complex, and quickly changing society, thereby taking their place as citizens and servants of the world. This year's award goes to Byron and Lisa Repko Borden. If you would please come forward. Lisa grew up in Europe and Southern California, arriving in Africa the week she turned 22. She has spent the last three decades nurturing new Christians, first among Kenyan students, then among the Maasai of East Africa's wilderness, and before that, six years among people, young people in Europe. Now back in Africa, her passion remains the development of simple, authentic faith among those she comes into contact with. Lisa writes, speaks, and teaches, and manages many details for WEMA Ventures. Byron has spent most of his life in East Africa and has grown increasingly passionate about enterprise as the best approach to the desperate poverty and broken economics on the continent he loves. Never afraid of new territory, Byron has thrown himself into facilitating business for transformation endeavors in East Africa. He is excited to wake up and get to work every day because he loves the way enterprise, instead of aid, is impacting young women and men that he is involved with. 
Together, Byron and Lisa have spent almost 30 years in full-time cross-cultural service. They have been married 31 years and have four grown children. Two are graduates, one is a current student. We hope the other one will be on her way when she finishes high school. And they have two daughters-in-law who are also Westmont alums, so a long line of Westmont. On a personal note, I have to say I remember Byron and Lisa from when they were students here, particularly Lisa. I had a chance to watch their relationship develop from afar. There was a great spirit about the two of them, the sort of presence that drew you in, that put you at ease, that helped you feel at peace. It was no surprise that they were drawn to the world of missions and the good deep work that is done there. While I was in church last week, our pastor quoted St. Augustine in referencing the um, Matthew 22 and talking about the wedding feast and the garments that one is to wear. And he said the garment is charitable love. That is the garment for the wedding feast. Charitable love for your neighbor. It asks each of us to put on, when we come to his banquet table, this, this charitable love, the love of God. This is the love that you give to neighbors that is not easy. And this is Byron and Lisa. Um, I just thought of them immediately when I heard that quote. So we're thrilled that they're here. One fun fact is that in two days, it will celebrate the 30th anniversary of their arrival together in Kenya. So it's very appropriate they are receiving the Global Service Award today. Well, we really are truly honored and somewhat overwhelmed and very jet lagged. <laughs> But we, we feel so touched to be honored by such a great community, a community that we have loved for so long and that has meant so much to us. Like, like Terry said, we arrived in Africa 30 years ago uh, this week. At the time, I told Byron I would give Africa 10 years. So apparently when we were at Westmont, we didn't learn to do any math. <laughs> Our Westmont experience is a gift that has grown more and more precious every year not just because we met each other here, not just because our sons met their wives here, no pressure on our third son who is here, <laughs> no pressure at all. But it was here that we learned that our faith could be academically rigorous, that God could handle our tough questions, and yet our faith was intimate and personal, and it was applicable and practical, and that it was to be lived out. It wasn't one or the other, it was all of those things. And so whether or not we were working among the Maasai, a pre-modern people who didn't read and write yet, or whether it was during our years in Europe when we were working with a post-modern young people covered in tattoos and piercings in the inner cities, God has welcomed us into his presence as we've asked him, what does faith look like in this context? What does it mean that there's so much suffering and poverty and oppression in the world? How are we supposed to live? How do we convey you in this context? He's welcomed all our questions and walked with us through all those times. <clears throat> I've spent most of my life in Africa, and I've seen the good and the bad and the ugly of mission endeavors and uh, development enterprises. And God knows that I've been a contributor to a lot of the good, I mean the bad and the <laughs> ugly. <laughs> um, I'm constantly conversing with God about the good news of Christ and how it's supposed to play out in everyday life, how it's supposed to change systems among people who are stuck in cycles of poverty. Is the good news just for eternity or is there practical good news today to, be tra to transform the daily lives of people and the poor, the very poor? Um, as we facilitate economic and development and discipleship with the very poor, Lisa and I don't feel like remarkable people, but we have a remarkable God Amen. who calls us to follow him with our whole lives. Isaiah asks us to remember that the fast that God loves is to pour yourself out on behalf of the hungry and to give yourself away on behalf of the oppressed. We have the privilege and the honor to struggle with what that means every day and to figure out how to do it in a transformational, effective way that's not detrimental. And just closing, we just want to thank Westmont and for the foundation that it gave us going to school here and the different things that we experienced, as well as just the encouragement 
along the way as we're traveling this journey. And um, for the way that you've nurtured our kids and we've watched them thrive and watched them be people that will really shape and influence the world with the kingdom of God. So thank you very much. Thank you so much. Our final presenter today is Dr. Gail Beebe. I think you all know Gail Beebe. This is, he is in his eighth year of presidency at Westmont College, and I truly believe that he is the right leader for the right time here at Westmont. Um, I do know that these gatherings uh, particularly energize Dr. Beebe. He loves being able to meet you. He loves being with people and hearing the stories. Um, and being able to see just how God has worked in all of your lives. So um, he will be presenting our alumna of the year, and then immediately following that, um, after Kristen Olson speaks, um, he will just come up and give some remarks as well about the college. So Dr. Beebe. Terry, thank you. I do love getting to know you and enjoy you. and. I love knowing your life story and it's just I love knowing where you're from and having a context of who you are and what has mattered to you and what has really shaped you. And it's a joy for me to introduce our alumna of the year. The alumna of the year award recognizes those members of the Westmont community who have distinguished themselves in their professional careers and whose life models the values of Westmont. The purpose is to recognize those who have made outstanding contributions to their profession, to their community, and in turn bring honor and distinction to the college as a result of their service. This year's recipient is Kristen Olson. Kristen, would you please come forward? Kristen is a graduate of the class of 1996, magna cum laude. She majored in communication studies. Her advisor, Dr. Greg Spencer, is here. And Greg, it's wonderful to have you in attendance. Thank you for coming. Greg is an example to me of just the hallmark of great Westmont faculty. Uh, loves their students, pushes them hard, and prepares them for a life of leadership and service. Kristen is a Republican leader. In the state assembly, she was first elected in 2010 from the 25th district. She's very decisive, a wonderful personality. I've loved the opportunity to get to know her and spend time with her during my time at Westmont. She was selected to serve as the chief Republican whip in her first term in office, was named a rising star by journalists and community leaders, and most recently has been selected by unanimous vote as the House Minority Leader beginning this fall. She's currently serving her third term, has successfully passed bills dealing with reforms to environmental education and veterans policies. She's very concerned about facilitating educational excellence and being engaged in things that improve job opportunities and communities. She's also been a leader introducing reform to enhance government accountability and transparency and has led by example as the first legislator to ever release their office budget. A dangerous trend. <laughs> Born, raised, and now raising her own family in Modesto, Kristen has a passion for the community's businesses and people of California's Central Valley. She previously served on the Modesto City Council from 2005 to 2010, where she first began uh, her astute focus on fiscal responsibility, public safety, and economic development. She also serves on the board for CASA, the Court Appointed Special Advocates, an organization promo promoting voluntary advocacy for abused and neglected children, and on the board for California Women Lead, an organization committed to encouraging and training women to be leaders in their communities. She's joined today by her husband, Rod, and their three beautiful children, JT, Sophie, and Grady. <laughs> Children, would you please stand so we can applaud you. It's wonderful to have you here. Kristen, on behalf of Westmont, we're so proud of you and grateful to welcome you back to campus and to honor you today. Thank you so much, President. 
Thank you. It is truly an honor to be here. And I, as the other recipients, was just overwhelmed and speechless to hear that I was being honored with this award this year. Uh, when I received the call from Dr. Beebe, we were actually on vacation in Lake Almanor with friends of ours from Westmont that we have been going to there for 13, 14, 15 years. And so what a better place to celebrate being heard about this award than being with Westmont friends. Until we found out that I was being honored with the Alumni of the Year Award and not the Young Alumni of the Year Award. <laughs> and we thought, how is that possible? Didn't we just graduate a couple years ago? Time flies. But I truly am grateful for this award today. I'm grateful for the memories that Westmont has given me and my family at this point, for the impact it, that it has had on my life. Uh, talking about the memories, all of us, I'm sure, remember Nictos, RFs, Spring Sing. I was very involved in Potter's Clay. One of my great memories was serving as an RA in Page Hall. And for those of you who knew her, Ken and Neil was the resident director at that time. And I have great memories of her pouring into my life and investing in me, despite the challenges that she and her own family were facing. I remember uh, Dr. Spencer dressing in a toga. I'm sure many of you probably had a similar class. And having class right out here on Magnolia Lawn, learning about Aristotle, Socrates, and Plato. Those are memories I cherish and have been able to share for the last 20 years. I'm so grateful for Westmont and the impact that it had on my life, not only while I was here, but for the lifelong impact it has had on my life. Teaching us to think very thoughtfully about issues, to break down and critically analyze both sides of an issue, and then be able to articulate our position with boldness and with kindness. Integrating faith into life. Westmont taught us how to integrate faith into the classroom, and that has been a great example as I try to fa integrate my faith into the workplace and into my role as a parent, which sometimes, as Sarah and I were talking about this morning, is the hardest role in life for integrating your faith. Relationships with faculty who cared about your success not only academically, but personally. My senior year, I had some struggles here that I was going through, and I thought they were invisible to most people, right? I'm pretty good at hiding the struggles. That's something I've tried to work on throughout my adult life. But I will never forget both Professor Giuliano, who's now at Wheaton College, and Dr. Spencer sitting me down and saying, what's going on? Something's going on, and helping me be vulnerable and open myself up to what was going on so that we could deal with it and move forward. That is unique. That's a Westmont experience, and I am so grateful for that. And for those relationships then to carry on further into our lives. There are times I've emailed or called Dr. Spencer and said, can you take a look at this speech for me, you know, and just critique it? I mean, who does that in most universities across the nation and across the globe? Westmont alums do that. I am so grateful for being introduced to great authors like Henry Nowen. Jim Halverson led leadership development classes when I was here. And one of the things Henry Nowen stated was, one of the main tasks of theology is to find words that do not divide, but unite. That do not create conflict, but unity. That do not hurt, but heal. And those are words that I try to apply to my life in politics, to the public sphere, because too often it's the opposite. And I think Westmont, as Westmont alums, we have the opportunity, whether it's in politics, whether it's in business, whether it's in missionary work, to lead by example in using words that create unity instead of conflict, words that heal instead of hurt. So thank you so much for this award. It gives me the opportunity to share the Westmont story. People in Sacramento and in Modesto say, I bleed Westmont. I love Westmont. All over my office are pictures from Westmont. And this now is another opportunity to share the Westmont story, to share that it's a place where we strive for excellence, a place of academic rigor that prepares us for the rigors of life, but a place that also teaches us the importance of balance and knowing how to play hard and not just work hard. That was hard for me, but Westmont told me and taught me about the importance of balance that serves me so well now today as I try to balance my roles as the Assembly Republican leader and as a wife and as a mother. It's not always easy, and Westmont planted the seeds to teach me how to do that. And then finally, Westmont planted the seeds to teach me how to be an ambassador of God's grace in the public square. 
So often in politics and in life, we see things so black and white, and we use harsh tones. But the older I get, the more I see how much gray there is in life, and how the greatest impact I can have in the public sphere is by being an ambassador of God's grace. Speaking my message boldly and with confidence, but doing it in a spirit of compassion and kindness that hopefully causes other people to question, something's different about her and then to hopefully ask me why, so that then I have the opportunity to share my faith. So thank you again for this award. I thought I'd close with my life verse as well as a couple of my favorite quotes. Beverly Buffini was a former Olympic volleyball athlete, and she wrote in a book called I Can, I Will, I Believe, dream big and do the ordinary with such consistency that your dreams become reality. And we now teach our kids to say I can, I will, I believe, because we can pursue our goals, we can achieve our dreams if we'll be deliberate and persistent and rely on our faith to get there. And that leads into my life verse, which is Joshua 1.9. Be strong and courageous, for the Lord your God is with you no matter where you go. In all the struggles, in all the opportunities, God is there. And then finally, individually, each of us may only be able to make a small dent in life. But as Alexander Solzhenitsyn said, only a small crack but cracks make caves collapse. And so I pray and hope and encourage each of us as Westmont alums to make those dents, to make those cracks in the opportunity that God gives our way because together we will make the cave collapse and we will see better days ahead in California, in the United States, on this campus and in our individual communities. So thank you, Dr. Beebe. Thank you, Westmont, for this incredible honor. I am so pleased to accept it and I will use it for good in sharing the message of the Westmont story. Kristen, thank you. That was marvelous. Boy, three great, three great awards, so four great recipients and wonderful message. Well, uh, part of my philosophy of life is that organizations like civilizations need an aspiring edge and that if you ever stop growing and reaching and striving to achieve that you stall out and eventually you begin to go into decay. And so the next horizon for Westmont has really been about pursuing opportunities that are totally consistent with our mission but allow us to extend the reach and influence of the college and so the latest next thing is the Institute for Global Learning and Leadership it's a capital project and five programmatic initiatives and the first is the Leadership Center we just received a million dollar gift from the Mosier Foundation a foundation based here in Santa Barbara and uh, to start a uh, leadership in emphasis, three-pronged approach, national conversations, regional executive education, and undergraduate leadership development. And last Friday, we had the privilege of welcoming John Meacham, a Pulitzer Prize winning presidential biographer to Santa Barbara, as the inaugural lecture, inaugural activity of the Mosier Center for Moral and Ethical Leadership. And it's just marvelous to have Mr. Meacham here, wonderful author, just a delightful speaker. And he focused particularly on the life and leadership of Thomas Jefferson and what are the leadership lessons that we can learn from Jefferson, what are the moral dilemmas he faced, what are some of the moral dilemmas he created. And uh, again, it was an opportunity for us to focus great thoughts, great minds, a uh, wonderful place for conversation. The next part, or the next lecture, pardon me, will be Bob Woodward on uh, January 16th, uh, best known or initially known for the Watergate uh, break-in but really has gone on to be a voice of balance and reason. Uh, it's remarkable to watch him on TV or in uh, speaking settings where he never says what he's supposed to, he only says what he thinks. And it's just kind of striking the way he will never go with uh, the direction people want him to. He really says, this is what I saw, this is what I heard. Doris Kearns Goodwin will be here March 6th as our president's breakfast speaker, and then Ron White, Dr. Ron White, who's a great American historian, American church historian, uh, will be speaking on Abraham Lincoln, May 29th. Beyond that, we really do want to focus on what can we do as a college to extend the reach and influence into the moral and ethical leadership uh, across our region. And so we'll be doing a conference, four-day conference in May, 
May 26 to 29 on the personal and professional development of the leader and then continuing to uh, initiate opportunities to kind of revitalize. Many of you who are here remember the opportunities you had to do leadership studies when you were here as an undergraduate. We're really working to revitalize that. The second is the Eaton Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. And we've uh, asked Rick Iflin to launch that program for us. Rick has taken a leave of absence from his company, leave of absence from the Board of Trustees to do that. And it's an opportunity for us to emphasize both capital entrepreneurship and social entrepreneurship. In fact, it was fun to hear the boards talk about their work. And here's Rick's basic principle or premise. In the fall, he teaches capital entrepreneurship. How do you put together all of the teams, capital, uh, project planning, uh, business planning that you need to launch a business in the richest country on the face of the planet. And then if you're really smart, in the spring we want you to take those same skills and abilities and figure out how to start a business on the poorest country or in the poorest country on the face of the planet. And that is when he takes a group of students to Haiti to set up microfinance enterprise. And it was just incredible. And if you go to our website, you can hear the stories of the students who went on this first venture, this inaugural trip to Haiti, port au pay where they began to build just the, the most minute businesses that are literally changing the lives of the people that they're helping uh, take on a sense of purpose, a sense of promise, a sense of real self-fulfillment. The third is the Center for Neuroscience and Leadership, and this is just uh, an opportunity for us to think together about how do we apply cutting-edge discoveries to leadership development. And we're discovering so many things at the molecular level that are a result of brain mapping and the capacity for brain mapping. I myself have undergone two brain maps, and uh, you know, what is the big hurdle you have to get over in order to do a brain map? Will they find one? <laughs> and once you're comfortable with that, then you just settle in and it's just amazing what you can learn. But the, the two that I've wanted to really understand, the first was to deal with empathy, the mirror neuron system that really indicates your capacity for rapport, and the development of greater capacity for self-regulation. Now here's what was interesting in that first brain map. Empathy, there, there's just so much evidence that your capacity for empathy is really kind of the foundation of your capacity to get along with people. And although we often have viewed it as kind of frozen, we just have a capacity or we don't, there's just total evidence, clear evidence, that you can develop a capacity for empathy. You can deepen your capacity to love and support other people. And so we really want to begin to understand that. We want to understand how human connection is made. And we also want to understand self-regulation. How do you avoid making career-limiting mistakes? And there's so many situations where we go forward in life and we see people who have great opportunities, but they absolutely lose their capacity to manage their emotions, and they ruin their opportunity. And we really want to understand that at a deeper level so that we can put together development plans that will actually assist them. And then the second brain map, uh, done uh, in a completely different way, uh, done by a company called Neurotopia, focuses on three primary areas of executive function that measure 10 specific measurements. The three areas are speed, focus, and stress management. And they deal with things like neurospeed, reaction time, accuracy, timing. Focus deals with how long can you actually concentrate. One part of it, a 22 minute part, is so mundane. And it's meant to be mundane to see if it can break your concentration. But it's out of that that you begin to develop a capacity to sustain yourself with concentration on important work. And then stress. How do you manage stress? And what's interesting about this is it takes you through this variability. So there are times when you should have high stress levels, and then there's times that you should have no stress levels. But if you have an elevated stress reading, which it totally picks up on, it indicates that you're a high-strung person. And again, through a growth and self-development pro process and plan, you can actually begin to learn how to manage your stress so that when it should be low, you go low. And when you should elevate to be on demand, uh, that you can rise to the occasion. The next is the Goebel Center for Global Learning. This was a gift given by Roy and Dion Goebel to really accentuate uh, the great commitment Westmont has made to global education. Uh, it is a bit of a tongue twister getting that out, the Goebel Center for Global Learning. Roy was worried that that would lead to all kinds of mockery, but you know he's a tough guy. He can take it. So. But here's what we've really wanted to, to deploy. The cycle of global learning was pioneered by two professors here at Westmont, Laura Montgomery and Mary Doctor. 
And they were really at the front edge, the leading edge of discovering, people had discovered different parts to it, but nobody had put it together this way, where there was three pieces to a semester abroad. There was the pre-trip experience, getting ready to go abroad. How do you enter a foreign culture? There was the in-trip mentoring. So many semester abroad programs really drop students off in a foreign country and don't really stay present with them. And Mary and Laura and all of the professors who take our students abroad, they don't hover, but they're really there to help interpret. And I often think of this line from T.S. Eliot in the Four Quartets where he said, so many of us have the experience but miss the meaning. In semester abroad experiences, so many students go abroad, have the experience but miss the meaning. We want the students both to have the experience and capture the meaning. And then the, the third and really the most critical piece is how do you bring the learning home? In so many opportunities and situations, we have recognized that students would come home and not know how to bring the learning with them. They'd feel very displaced both from their friend group and their family. And so how do we work to allow them to reintegrate back into their host culture, uh, as well as bring this incredible experience uh, back into their life? <coughs> The, and then a second piece of this, and again, an exciting piece, and this, Pam and I were reflecting last night on just, we had been with some of our faculty at the barbecue, and we were just marveling at just how outstanding the faculty are. And I just love seeing them, and I, I, Greg Spencer, realizing how much he meant to Kristen, Greg is, and I don't mean to embarrass him, but it, it he is just, to me, an ideal faculty member. The uh, he is such a great role model for our students. He's incredibly bright and capable in the classroom. And he, he keeps after them. He pushes them so hard. And then they host, when, when the students come back, pardon me, the alums come back, he and Janet, his wife Janet, host the students on Friday nights for receptions. They keep this lifelong relationship going. It isn't just a passing fad. And so I just love the fact that Greg and Janet are a faculty couple that really embody the values of Westmont, and so many uh, of our faculty really live into that. One of our new, newer, absolutely, they're worthy of our praise. But just as Laura and Mary did some of the pioneering work in the cycle of global learning, a newer faculty member, Dr. Carmel Saad, an Egyptian national raised up in the Sacramento area, uh, Carmel is in our psychology department, and she is doing some fascinating research on what happens when we go overseas. And her research is able to demonstrate that spending as little as 15 weeks in a foreign country actually activates that part of the brain that we reach for when we have to engage creative problem solving. Now let me give you an example of this that was unbeknown to me, but I could totally feel it when I started to read her research. We were on the alumni and parent trip in Rome. And you remember that day, Terry, that we had free and so we could go anywhere and we went up to Florence. Well, we got to the train station and my Italian was a little rusty, <laughs> mostly because I've never taken Italian. <laughs> and I was trying to figure out the screen because I knew the train was going to leave in 12 minutes and I had to figure out how to buy tickets. And I know I was reaching for that part of my brain that deals with creative problem solving. It just, there wasn't anything there to activate. <laughs> and so, <laughs> thankfully, this nice Italian man came over and for a slight Euro tip, was willing to help buy the tickets. <laughs> but when I read Carmel's research, I thought that is exactly what was going on in that moment. I was in a very different place, trying to figure out how to solve a problem. And you begin to reach for all of these other experiences and resources in a way that you typically don't. Well, the idea is to get as many of our students overseas so that they can begin to have these kinds of experiences, both the cycle of global learning and the opportunity to really engage the parts of our brain that we need for creative problem solving the rest of our life. Now, there's so many other great things you're going to enjoy. Uh, many of us will enjoy the soccer games today. Athletics continues to be a real delightful part of life at Westmont. Uh, the Board of Trustees will be coming to town this next week. This will be the final board meeting at which uh, Vince Nelson, a class of 63 alum, uh, he'll complete six years of service as our board chair. The new board chair will be Peter Thorrington. Uh, Peter didn't attend Westmont, but his son Mark did. And uh, Peter and Monique are actually immigrants from South Africa. Uh, moved here over 30 years ago and have just been a wonderful part, both of the Westmont family as well as the board of trustees. 
We continue to welcome new people to Westmont. Uh, again, part of what we were reflecting on yesterday, we saw Sue Savage, who just retired, just an all-star faculty member. And then last night, we were sitting uh, on a blanket with four new faculty members. Uh, and you just think of everything that walked out the door when Sue retired, all of that wisdom and knowledge, and then the hope that these brand new faculty will really embrace uh, the way of Westmont and live into both their discipline, but also into the lives uh, of our students and really pour themselves into the lives of our students. And then Dr. Edie Schultze, she's not here this morning, but many of you got to hear her yesterday at lunch, uh, our new VP of Student Life. Uh, many of you know Jane Higa, who contracted ALS and went very quickly. Uh, she's been retired less than two years and just had her memorial service in August. But God in his grace has brought us just an outstanding uh, successor, and we're so grateful that Edie's here. She's settling in beautifully and just doing a, a great job. Many of you have asked me about uh, things like college affordability, accessibility, competitiveness. And I wanted to say that if you have children or grandchildren that are considering college, I realize that we come off as at the high end of the affordability index. Now I say it that way so that I can refer to us as affordable. But the, the, the truth of the matter is, the truth of the matter is if you, we have generous financial aid. And it just continues to impress me that even though we may, end, we may look like we cost more uh, on paper, we often come in the same or even more affordable than all of the schools we compete against. And so I just really encourage you, go through the process, see what scholarships you'll qualify for, and give us a shot because we'd love to have your children and your grandchildren be part of the Westmont family. More than anything, continue to pray for Westmont. I love what we get to do here. I often talk about the twin rails, the rigorous academics and the deep love for God. We're equal, equally committed to both. We realize that we have to honor God in everything we do, but we also have to strive to achieve great academic rigor so that we can be prepared not just to serve in every sphere of society, but literally to lead in every sphere of society. And I think it's both the burden and the calling of Westmont to turn out alums that will really take responsibility for all aspects of life and will seek to serve in a way that honors God and really gives back to society. Thank you for coming today. It's wonderful to be a part of the program with you. God be with you. Thank you so much, Dr. Beebe. I think you got a taste of what I meant when I said is the right leader for the right time. I think so many of us here, we have great memories. There's a legacy that's here. We, we look at the campus and in so many ways, it looks the same, but we have to be ahead of the game. We have to be on the cutting edge in terms of um, what we're doing with our students and with leaders and with affordability. And I really believe that Dr. Beebe and his team and the, and the staff as a whole are really committed to that and are doing some really great things in terms of the kinds of students and programs that we are providing here at Westmont. So we are privileged um, that you all get to be part of that. And um, the comments that he made are about affordability. It's a perfect segue into our next uh, presentation. We as alums have the opportunity and the privilege to sort of pay it forward um, and be able to help those students who, who need that assistance to come to Westmont College. And the annual fund um, is a part of that whole piece. And as you have contributed as a class for this reunion giving, I'm gonna ask doc doctor, I'm gonna ask Trina Hudson, the director of annual giving, to come up and just give a little quick report on um, the reunion giving and where we are on that. So Trina, come on forward. Well, Westmont College is an institution that has much to be thankful for, and as we've heard, um, today we have recognized just a few of our remarkable alumni for their service, both here and around the world. And not only do our alums give of their time and their talent, but they also give of their treasure. So on behalf of the Office of Annual Giving, I am here to present to you and to Dr. Beebe the 2014 Reunion Class Gifts. And among other things, these gifts will go to support scholarships allowing current students and future generations to receive the same distinctive Westmont education that we all are so thankful for. So the 11 classes that are celebrating reunions this homecoming are 2009, 2004, 1999, 1994, 
1989, 1984, 1979, 1974, 1969, 1959, and 1954. And Dr. Beebe, it gives me much joy and thankfulness to announce to you that the combined total of these classes is $1,028,751. That's fantastic. Thank you, Trina, and for your office and the hard work that you do. That concludes our time together here at the brunch. We have a number of activities going on the rest of the day, and I certainly hope that you take part and participate in that and continue to enjoy one another and enjoy our beautiful campus. And um, just thank you so much for being here. Have a great day.